Hello and welcome to the Bikes for Death podcast. My name is Patrick and I'm your host. This is a show that talks about bikepacking, adventuring, and the cool people who participate. And first off, let me just say that I have a cold in June in Texas and it's 100 degrees outside. I'm not sure how that's possible, but here we are. So if I sound a little stuffy, then that that's why. Um, but today's guest is Jan Bennett who I'm not sure how well known she is like across the globe or whatnot, but uh, in, in Texas, I feel like she's really well known. She's just a wealth of information whenever it comes to bikepacking, whether it's like routes or just anything like what to eat and how to pack your bike and what gear you should use and why you should use it and, and all that stuff. And that's an area that I'm, I'm not, uh, not as knowledgeable in, um, I, I'm the kind of person that relies on people like her to kind of do the product testing and be like, Hey, this is what you should use. And then I read what she says and I'm like, yeah, that sounds pretty good. I'll do that. Um, so I, I definitely appreciate her and I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to get, uh, all of her little, maybe not all of them. She has a lot more than what we covered on the show, but I'm excited that we were able to kind of scratch the surface of some of the things that she has floating around in her, in her brain and putting that out there for, for everybody. But on, on top of all the information that she has, uh, and the experiences that she has, I truly appreciate the way that she's living her life. Um, we'll talk more about it, but she's made conscious efforts and decisions to focus her life on the things that really bring her joy and happiness and to shed the things that were just kind of weighing her down and not bring her the happiness that she was looking for in life. And that can be a really hard and scary thing to do. And it's something that I, I really respect. Um, and so she's a, she's just a great example of, of somebody who has identified the thing in her life that really makes her happy and then made the decisions, um, to be able to spend more time doing those things. So, so yeah, I I hope that resonates with y'all as well. I think it's a a really impressive thing and I definitely, uh, look up to her and aspire to that, uh, in my own life. All right, before we get to the show, just a few notes. If you have been spending a lot of your time trying to think of ways that you can support the Bikes for Death podcast, I have great news for you. Not only can you go on Patreon and sign up as a patron to financially support the show, not only can you go to iTunes and leave a five-star review, but now there is a third option. You can go to my website, it's bikesordeath.com, and I've set up a super fancy hyperlink. Uh, It's an Amazon affiliate hyperlink. And if you will click on that, bookmark it as your Amazon shopping for anything you want link, then every time you spend money on Amazon, it doesn't cost you anything, but it takes money away from Jeff, Jeff Bezos and puts it into my pocket which I think we can all agree, Jeff has enough billions of gazillions of dollars and he doesn't need any more, but I do. I need that money or I want it. I could use it, right? I could use that money to to benefit the show, to compensate me for my time and all that. So I think it's a great way for, uh, for y'all who are just, you're dying for a way to help. I know you do. I know you want to support the show. I know you want it to grow. I know you want it to be better. And I know that you're spending a lot of your time trying to figure out what you can do to support the show. But hey, I'm here for you guys. I I am here for you and I have a great solution. So pick one of those options, pick all three, pick two out of three, doesn't matter. But please uh, find your way to support the show. And uh, hey, I, I appreciate it. And so does everybody else who enjoys this content. One quick note on the actual website itself. Um, It looks like Mickey Mouse designed it, and that's because I am currently trying to teach myself how to build a website, and I really don't know how. Um, So yeah, the website kind of looks like crap, and it'll probably go through about a thousand different iterations of designs and layouts and colors and blah, 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 until I can, uh, you know, get it where I want it to be. Um, but in the meantime, the Amazon affiliate link works perfectly. So just ignore all that other stuff, head right to that Amazon link and give it a click All right. Well, I think that's all I got for you, except for the show. All 
All right. Today I am uh, sitting down with Jan Bennett. Uh, thanks for coming to my house and talking bikes. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. And I know we like just we've been she's in Dallas and I'm in College Station. We're about three and a half hours apart. And so I just put it on a radar and I'm like, all right, let's uh, try to connect anytime we're in each other's vicinity. And we've been trying to connect for a while. And so thanks for sticking it out. And you're here. Yeah. Um, I think like a good way to start the podcast would just probably be to like talk about what you did in the last like three or four days because you didn't get to College Station like the way most people would. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I took the train from Dallas to Temple Yeah. and then rode my bike from Temple down to Luling for an event down there. How far was that? Yeah. Um, I think it was about 150 miles down. Um, took three days just kind of took my time scouted some new stuff found some really cool really cool roads yeah yeah scouting just for fun just for fun yeah yeah and uh what was the event that you were doing in lolling uh it was the yellow rose rambler from spinistry kevin lee yeah so he had a route that he put together down there for a gravel event. And then he's been adding on some bike packing options to a lot of his events so that we can do some just overnights. Yeah. Is that what this was? Uh, this was one of those. Yes. So how many miles was it? Uh, the total route was 90 miles. So 50 miles the first day and then 40 miles back. So it wasn't a, a race. It was just an event. Um, he may have had a race for the just gravel right. part of it, but yeah, the bike packing stuff was just go have fun. Yeah. So you pure lail fashion, you rode to the start of the event and then, uh, well, I think you got it. You hitched a ride uh, <laughs> after that, but yeah, you ride to the start of the, so you rode more miles getting to the event than you actually rode oh, yeah. for the event. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's go back a little bit. Um, yeah, I'd love to just get a little bit of your history in cycling and then how you got into bike packing, when you got into bike packing, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I started out by riding road. Um, we used to have motorcycles and a way to cross train for motorcycles is to ride bicycles. And so we picked them up and about a year after that realized we hadn't ridden our motorcycles. <laughs> so, really? yeah. So we, uh, it kind of took off for us and from there, I like I said, I started racing road. Got pretty serious into that. When was this? How long ago? Um, about four years ago was my last race. Okay. Yeah. Um, worked my way up to category two. Started to kind of dive into the national scene a little bit, mm. and then had a pretty bad crash and hurt my back. So I had to take about five months off of all activity. And then Yikes. the only bike I could ride after that for a while was a more upright bike. And so I kind of got into touring a little bit. And the more time I spent out, the more I was like, I just really want to be on those gravel roads and see what's out there. Yeah. And that just kind of went from there. And I haven't raced since then. <laughs> I want to hear about the motor motorcycles. What were y'all doing with that? Were y'all racing motorcycles? Uh, we were doing track days. So yeah. we were preparing to race basically, but my husband had a pretty bad accident and broke the head off his femur and we had to kind of take a step back. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah. I ask, I, uh, actually used to own a motorcycle business and, uh, rode crotch rockets, sport bikes, like for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, it just got to the point where like too many people were getting injured and, uh, yeah, I had a daughter and I was like, you know what, I'm going to just hang up the, the bike. I don't, I think it's something I'd like to pick up later on, you know, like a touring bike and go like tour the desert, like, like a dual sport, dual sport, like when I'm like 80 or something and yeah. I can't ride my bike, but now we have e-bikes. So it's really like limitless now. Like I, I we can bike pack until we die, you know, it's totally. Like, <laughs> yeah. I was just in Arkansas and I was pulling the baby, the baby trailer and we're going up this steep hill and this old dude passed me just, you know, like, I don't even know if he was pedaling, you know, he's just like, doo, 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 doo. but Hey, respect. I, yeah. I'm going to be there one day. Hopefully yeah. it's a long, long ways from now. But yeah, I, um, I love the motorcycles, but man, the danger aspect of it is Absolutely. like, it's, it's a little risky. So, um, so that was like four years ago that you got into touring. I think it was about four years ago. Yeah. Did you have, did you come to it with like a lot of like outdoor experience? Um, a, a decent amount. I yeah. did uh, a lot of outward bound trips, like through high school 
you know, the eight day trips. I did three of them in high school. And then I've just always been all about being outside. So, Whoa, I've never even heard of those. What is that? Um, so it's similar to the Knowles stuff, the uh, National Outdoor Leadership School. So Outward Bound is kind of another version of that. And it's basically you sign up for a trip and they take you out, they guide you. Um, and you go out in the wilderness and you can do backpacking or sea kayaking or dog sledding or, Whoa. you know, just any number of things, basically. What what age range is it? Is it for oh. a specific group of people, like high school students? or they, they have courses that are all different kinds. Like they'll have women's only or 30 plus or couples courses or high school, you know, teenagers. Okay. Um, yeah. So they have a bunch of different types of classes or wow. events, I guess you could say. Man, that's so cool. I can't believe I've never heard of that before. <laughs> I feel like I should. I grew up in the Boy Scouts, and so that was like my introduction. So I guess I wasn't seeking other avenues to like go experience outside. But I always wonder for women specifically, because the Girl Scouts is not quite at that level. Right. Um, and, and one thing I've noticed, and we can talk more about this here in a little bit maybe, but like there's a lot of women in the sport that have never had any outdoor experience before. And I just, it's something that was kind of blind to me. I didn't, I didn't realize that. And so where are you going to get that experience from if your parents aren't taking you camping? Exactly. So that's, that's super cool that you, why did you decide to do that? What, what age were you? Um, I think my first one was probably freshman or no, it was eighth grade. Wow. It was eighth grade was my first one. And then I did another one. I think my, between my freshman and sophomore year and then another one, I believe it was between my junior and senior year. Wow. So you're, you're just an adventurous spirit, like from a young age. You could say that. <laughs> yeah. Did, were, is your family like outdoorsy or? Not at all. So you, man, were you rebelling from your parents? You're like, I'm just going to get away. Probably. I'm going to get dirty. <laughs> yeah. 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 My, my uh, grandmother raised me and she did not like the fact that I like to play in the mud. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Wow. That's so cool. Well, that, that's, yeah. And I think that's so important that, um, that there's organizations out there that makes me like super excited. And I'm glad we're, I'm glad you're talking about it mm -hmm. that, cause I didn't know about it. Hopefully other people will, uh, take advantage of that too. Yeah. Um, and Outward Bound does offer scholarships too. So if, uh, you know, the trip seems a little out of reach, I would definitely say to just look into the scholarship option. Yeah. Good. Thank you. All right. So I follow you on Instagram and on Facebook, you're active like with the Texas bike packing. You are always on a bike trip or on some <laughs> kind of like you are the most well-traveled person I follow, I think. How do you do it? I have a few theories. You either won the lottery or you got one of those emails from like an African prince and there was like a long lost relative <laughs> and you were like, yes, that was my relative. Send me the money. But I'm, I'm kidding. But yeah, I mean, how do you have the time? Like, how do you find the time to be able to go and do all these trips? So we, a few years ago, um, made the decision to really look at our lives and step back on a lot of stuff that, you know, at the time you, you feel like they're necess necessities, but you know, in the long run, like, what is it really going to gain us? Yeah. I, I was talking about material. Mm -hmm. I'm much more interested in the experiences and being able to end my day saying, okay, I've learned something or I've seen something new or, yeah. I've, you know, gone out and explored. So yeah, we made some life adjustments and it is what it is. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit more about, cause that's something that I'm really personally interested in and have been very intentional about cutting out crap in my life that I don't need. Like the house we're in, we, you know, we're planning on upgrading. We're not, we're going to stay. It's like a 1500 square foot house. It's fine. You know, I have a nice backyard. Like, um, my Ford, that new truck, I'm like selling that one. And I bought the 1991 Toyota four runner paid cash. Like, I'm like, I don't need like an ego truck. Like I don't need a, uh, this expensive truck that like makes me look cool or mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like I'm, I'm, it's something that I wish I discovered early, earlier in my life, you know, because I used to buy like two bikes a year. And I mean, just, it's like, oh man, 
yeah. so much money. And if you like look at your life, all right, okay, what did all those new bikes equal? Or what is that truck? What is the value of that truck? And you just, you, they don't really carry any significance in your life, you know, mm -hmm. like, so yeah. Can you talk a little bit about more about your process of, well, for one, riding my bike all day, every day, doesn't really cost a whole lot. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. So, you know, you find ways to cut corners, um, even, even while out on a trip, you know, yeah. just stay at the primitive sites, especially here in Texas, you know, the wild camping is not really looked well upon in yeah, Texas since yeah. we're so private Gotta be careful so privately owned um but yeah basically like we don't a lot of people do this now we don't have cable tv at home you know we've really kind of moved our lives away from watching tv in general mm -hmm. um which I have realized has made a big difference because you know you're watching tv and you're seeing what you what society is probably telling you you know you right. should be doing yeah. and the more you're away from that, you're like, no, I just, I really don't need all that. Right. I'm happy. I'm really happy doing this. Like, I don't think that the, you know, new 60 inch TV is going to make me any happier. Right. So. Or the content that comes on it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a great point. I mean, you don't miss it when you're out riding your bike and you're camping and you're seeing a beautiful sunset or right. watching a starry night or whatever it is like the last thing you were thinking about is the season finale of game of thrones exactly. that's tonight <laughs> <laughs> and we are gonna there's, i think that's like the only tv show yeah that is the only tv show we watch yeah. together as, as a couple and then i try to i've i've gotten on a good kick of reading a lot like getting back in the habit of reading at night instead of watching yeah. tv and that's that's way more fulfilling and no, I've done, I've done the same thing yeah. lately. Yeah. I've, I've started to get back into reading more and it's, it's easier for me to just kind of disconnect when I'm reading right. than when I'm sitting watching TV because I can just, you know, grab my phone, look at my phone exactly. while I'm watching TV. You know? I was about to say that. Yeah. <laughs> you're just, you're watching TV, but then you're like on Instagram and other stuff and mm -hmm. yeah, firing off emails. But if you read, you just, you sit there and you read. Mm -hmm. So what's a good book you've read recently? Oh man. Put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> It's, it's been a while. I do a lot of audiobooks. Yes. So yeah. I've kind of, I've enjoyed, um, like the silo series. I'm not familiar it's, with that one. It's kind of a post-apocalyptic, okay. you know, the world's come to an end and there's people living in silos underground and it's kind of yeah. the story about how that happens. So okay. I really enjoy longer audiobooks on the bike stuff right. that really I, I can kind of lose myself in for 40 hours for a book, you know? Yeah. So I was talking to Lael and she said the exact same thing on her AZT, uh, attempt. She did, uh, uh, Harry Potter. Yeah. So that, like, that's a good one. You just put it in. And we talked about that where like, and, and I'm curious if this is similar for you, but like I use, uh, audio as a way to like, keep my mind relaxed while my body is going through something like more intense. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find that helps to just keep you relaxed? And, oh yeah. 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 Cause I, I can find myself if, you know, man, this, this climb is just, it's brutal. Like, uh, wait, I just missed what happened in the book. Okay. Hold on. I got to rewind. Okay. <laughs> now I can, oh wait, now I'm at the top of the climb, you know? Yeah. So it, yeah, it's it definitely gives you a little distraction Yeah. and it doesn't take away from like your other senses of like sight and just experiencing where you're at, you know, yeah. I find it, yeah, it helps sometimes. I was going to ask you what, if you listen to anything, um, when you ride or, you know, what, what you do to kind of keep, you do a lot of solo. Oh yeah. 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 A lot well, of solo stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're going to talk more about that cause I'm super interested. I think you'll have some great experience to share, but I had a, okay. So I have a fun question for you. You're, uh, you're at a, a cocktail party. I'm sure you go to lots of them. Oh yeah. Tons. <laughs> That's like your scene. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and someone's like, so Jan, you ride your bike across the country like how do you explain to people what you do if they don't if they don't really have like a framework to understand what you're talking about yeah so the best most concise way i've found that most people seem to get pretty quickly is it's backpacking on a bicycle yeah it's you know i, I have everything i need and i'm comfortable using it all i can just take off and I have food, I have water, I have shelter. Yeah. How empowering is that? It's awesome. Yeah. That's the best feeling. And that's what really going back to our earlier conversation and maybe you're similar. It's like that really helped inform my 
understanding of how little we really need to be happy. You know, did, did it, did it? Absolutely. Have, was yes. that it? Really? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's been a process. I mean, m- everyone does it when they first start getting into bikepacking, right? We pack our fears. We pack yes. so much stuff. And then the more you do it, the more you trim your kit down mm-hmm. for the most part, you know, you go out for an overnight and you carry no, three yeah. times more things than you need. Right. Cause they're, they're fun, comfortable, whatever. But yeah. Yeah, you'll take that camping chair that or absolutely. something, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I saw that in your picture for your camping setup. This one, actually, I'm just remembering back to that Facebook yeah. post and there was that little, yeah. Yeah. The chair is, is kind of my one item, my one luxury. I just, at the end of a long day to be able to sit down and lean back yeah. is just, yeah, I need it. <laughs> Dude, that's a good, that's a good one. Uh, whenever I did that trip to Big, uh, to Big Ben Ranch uh, mm-hmm. State Park with the Adventure Media class, there was one kid who brought that probably a very similar chair to what you had. And we, I had a long car, not super long, but I talked to him I'm like, you know, I feel like that's one weight penalty that I, I would really be totally fine with mm-hmm. because like, you're just so tired. You want a nice place to just sit around the campfire, eat your food, drink your coffee in the morning. Like, yeah, yeah that's not, a, not have to be hunched over in your tent, yeah. you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. What what chair do you use? I'm curious. It's the the goals, not the goal zero, the um, chair zero. Chairs. I think that's the same one he had. Yeah. Okay, Wait, so it that, weighs a pound. Yeah, that's know? the one. It yeah. folds up pretty good. All that folds up yeah. small. It's it's not cheap, but it's super durable and it's a pound. It packs down pretty small. All right. Well, this is that's a perfect segue because like my perception of you is, uh, I mean, you are a, a wealth of information. <laughs> Anytime you post something on Instagram or uh, on Facebook, um, actually, I have an example. Okay, so this was just yesterday. Okay. Somebody posted up on Texas Bikepacking and was talking about uh, what seat bag they should use for their wife. And somebody else is like, ask Jan. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, she's on a small cutthroat too, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're, you're like the... Uh, you're like the encyclopedia, especially for like Texas bikepacking. It's like, oh, I want to know about this. Ask Jan. Jan knows. <laughs> and so you gave like a really, a really good response with like a lot of information. And you were talking about how, what is it? You bought a piece of copper plumbing coupling pipe, put a layer of electrical tape on the seat post, slid the coupler over the seat post, then used more electrical tape to secure <laughs> it. And that's how I got, uh, that's how I got away with using the bindle on a, Centase. Cent- oh, the carbon fiber seat post, basically. Carbon fiber yeah. seat, seat post, yeah. Like, okay, so the question is, I mean, number one, that's cool, and thank you for, like, being that wealth of information for so many people who are wanting to get into the sport, but in such a short period of time, how did you acquire all that knowledge? Because you only get it through either researching it or doing it and kind mm-hmm. of learning through tri- trials. and. Yeah, I, I guess for me, I've always been, like, if this is the way everyone's doing it, that doesn't necessarily mean anything to me because mm-hmm. um, maybe that doesn't work for me. And so instead of trying to fit the way everyone else does it to my way of doing things, I just kind of approach it like, well, I need this to work on this. So how can I make that happen? Yeah. So, yeah. Do you have any type <laughs> of like, I don't know, like an engineering or any background where? Yeah. So my I initially started at Texas A&M with a, uh, was focused on a degree in manufacturing mechanical engineering okay. technologies. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you have, you have a mind for that anyway. Yeah. Cause yeah. I mean, I didn't even, I, what I just read, like I didn't understand that. I'm not, <laughs> I don't have a mind for that you yeah. know, like, at all, Yeah. but I respect it. And I'm glad that somebody out there does. And then they put that information out there so other people can benefit from it. You I'm know? good. I, Thank you for saying that. I, I like knowing that it's helping. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, you're like the go-to person in Texas, I feel like, <laughs> if you want to know anything about bikepacking. I'm not I'm not just tooting your horn. Like, I mean, I'm sure you're um, you're aware. I mean, that is not an uncommon occurrence where someone's like, ask Jan. You know, like, that's pretty, pretty yeah. common. And that's cool in, like, such a short period of time that you've, like, just amassed all this information. And I think part of it is, like, going back to, like, probably – how you've reconfigured your life to be more, uh, make you more available to go on these types of trips, which every time you go on a trip, you learn something. Absolutely. You know? Even if it's an overnight 
You know, yes. Even if it's an overnight that didn't actually happen, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's still like the, the process of preparing for it. You learn something. Right. You know, so. So I, I'm going to ask you a hard one for fun. Um, okay. So since you are so knowledgeable, I don't want to build you up too much, I'm, but I mean, I, I do, you, you have a, a, a really, uh, like a vast array of information, knowledge about bike packing, but what is something that you struggle with or are not good at, or are currently like working on improving? Wow. Um, there are some times that I feel like I've trimmed my kit back too much. Oh. Yeah, like where, man, I thought about, you know, putting that one item in and set it aside at the last minute. And now I'm here and I, you know, wish I had those long pants <laughs> instead of my rain pants only, you know, yeah. something like that. So but that's that's a hardcore answer. <laughs> the thing you're not good at is taking too little. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's gone. It's like a pendulum, right? Uh -huh. So like you first start out, like I mentioned earlier, uh, you first start out and you take everything in the kitchen sink and mm -hmm. I had gone to one extreme and now it's like, Oh, okay, let's, let's come back. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I still want to enjoy this right. while I'm out here and not, not be miserable. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, that's, a, that's actually good. I haven't reached that other side of the pendulum yet. Like I'm, I feel like my kit right now is, is, pretty dialed in like mm -hmm. I, Jared Foster asked me when we were on that trip he was like what did you bring that you didn't use or didn't need and I couldn't think it like I've every single piece of whatever other than like repair equipment or right. whatever um, I used you know Perfect. and I was like man all right I nailed it yeah so now the next step you're telling me is I'm gonna have to like start taking away things that I wish I had with me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you don't, you don't have to do that. I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. If you're happy with your kit right now, then yeah. yeah, if it's what keeps you comfortable out there, you know? So where, what's the motivation to keep taking away, you know, quote unquote luxury items? I, I want to go further and see more. And for me, in order to feel comfortable doing that and going to more remote places, I, mm. I want to, lighter more compact kit basically leaves you, room for water and food <laughs> yeah yeah no that's those are those are the things that really matter yes <laughs> water food a shelter is great yeah outside of that you're gonna be okay yes you know i mean if your bike breaks you can walk it i mean god it's that's such a liberty liberating feeling to yeah. like i mean you got food water shelter i mean can i room. can i fix my bike enough to limp to the next road where I think there's going to be someone there or yeah. in the next town, you know, Let, let's go back to the very beginning. Like okay. what was your first like trips like, because I, you know, so often we talk about these epic rides and the races and we're going to talk about the pony express, uh, a route that you're working on mm -hmm. in a little bit, but like that is such a daunting thing for most people to look at and be like, Oh my gosh, like that's huge. So like, how did, yeah, like, let's go back to the beginning because I think it'll be helpful for people to understand. Like, I mean, you're, you get on your bike and you go wherever you want to go and you're totally fine. But what for, was the, for the most part, most I part. wouldn't, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't yeah. say anywhere, but yeah. 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 So what was the, what, how'd you like get into it? Um, so Really, my some of my first bikepacking experiences, we were driving across the desert in Utah, Nevada, and I had a road bike with me. Stopped, I got out, started riding, and, you know, go by a dirt road that you can see for miles that it just goes off, and then off the distance it climbs this mountain. I want to know where that went. I can't do it on this road bike. Mm -hmm. So then, like, the next year, I'd plan a route through there, and, you know, I had five liters of water with me and four hours later I was out of water 40 miles from the road you know completely in over my head you know had to hit the come help me button so my husband could come get me <laughs> you know he wasn't very far thankfully so yeah making mistakes like that you just I learned you know I learned from all my mistakes uh and just kind of kept pushing kept pushing further to to see what else was out there how do you, how do you like test out your gear or your setup or your tent or all that kind of stuff? Like yeah. you just go on little mini trips? Pretty or? much. Yeah. If, 
if like I'll plan a trip and if the weather looks like it's going to be bad, I mean, as long as we're not talking four inch hail and tornadoes, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll just say, you know what, this is my chance to test it. You right. know, sometimes if I'm at home and a storm's rolling through, I'll set my tent up out back. Yeah. Um, and kind of try a different way of pitching it or, you know, something like that. And yeah. Kind of go out there every now and then and see what's going on, you know. I love that. I That's something that I talk about. I do a lot of testing in my backyard. Um, I have a decent amount of camping experience, but you get new equipment. You need to know how to use it. I got into hammock camping, and that was a whole new world. Oh, yeah. You know, and um, so I love to put that out there, like, you can just go in your backyard and you'll be the crazy person. And all the neighbors think you're like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm fine. I'm fine being that crazy person. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do, yeah. It, I do it a lot with, um, I started to kind of look at, uh, food options. So like oh, yeah. making my own meals <clears throat> with, yeah, let's talk about food options. That's great. Yeah. Freeze dried, dehydrated foods. Like what, what is available out there? What can I throw together that, you know, makes a great meal in the back country, right? What does make a great meal in the back? Like, oh, let's. I love a, a good vegetable curry quinoa. Yeah. So do you freeze dry it yourself and then? Mm, I or... haven't gotten quite there yet. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, just kind of, you know, I, I, I love a lot of different types of food. And so kind of throwing some ideas together and even just at home, I'll just kind of rummage through the pantry. I, I kind of have a stock of of a bunch of different, you know, freeze dried or dehydrated individual items. And I'll just kind of use that as my grocery store and Mm. create some stuff and throw it in a bag and take it out with me. Are you doing any cooking when you camp or? Yes, absolutely. That's, that's part of the best part to me is, is at the end of a long day, you're tired and you can just get your chair, Mm -hmm. (laughs) sit in your chair and just take everything in while you're cooking a quick meal. You know, instead yeah. of just unwrapping that sandwich from the grocery store right. or from the convenience store. Yeah, I, I'm with you there. Like whenever I did the Grand Gravel 500, I brought my stove and I mm-hmm. brought food. And food's, it's like, oh, man, after a long day, like you just want a reward. Yeah. I actually wound up not using it because I was so tired. I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. 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 In, a, in a race, I can definitely I think see I, that. Yeah, I wasn't really racing, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I was in a race, but not racing. Right, right. Um, it was my first one. and. Yeah, I finished. That's all I really cared about. Hey. No, but yeah, I think I made. I only made coffee one time. It was a rough morning. Couldn't even walk. My legs were so. Oh. I mean, I was just done. I woke up and tried to stand up outside of the hammock, and I just like fell to the ground. Yeah. And so I, I was like, well, I can't walk. I might as well sit here and drink some coffee and try to like, <laughs> you know, try to try to get going again. Yeah, just try to warm the engine back up. Yeah. I used my bike as a crutch, and I just kind of like walked. Um, up and down this gravel road with my bike and then i like started riding and then Mm -hmm. eventually like got back going again but just had to prime it (laughs) yeah i just had to had to get it going that's the only time i use it but like on i don't do like racing really isn't like my thing i'm more interested in the experience Mm -hmm. um and yeah having the coffee in the morning and the food at night and just enjoying where you're at you know all that stuff so speaking of that like what like what motivates you to go and and do these epic trips or even small trips? Like, I just want to see stuff. I want to, I want to see stuff before I got into bikepacking. Talking with people was hard for me. It was, it was a daunting task. And Hmm. then I've realized, especially on my Pony Express trip this last year, like I'm in the middle of a cornfield in Nebraska and the farmer drives by and I stood there and talked to him for 30 minutes about what I'm doing and talked to him about what life is like out there and just kind of get a completely different perspective on things. And Mm. that has really motivated me just to, I love going uh, to different places and just seeing how different people live kind of what, what makes them get through a day, Mm -hmm. you know, a week, a month, whatever. So have you had some pretty crazy reactions from people Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you started where, you know, how far have you gone or how yeah. long, how, how, how many miles have you done today? You know, right. stuff like that. And of course, you know, are you alone? And those kind of questions of course always come up, but yeah. it's, uh, yeah, I, I just, I, I like, it's kind of been that complete flip for me. Now I really enjoy going out and talking 
to complete strangers. <laughs> like me. Yeah. 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 You're doing well. I mean, you came on a podcast and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for yeah. someone who doesn't like talking, that's yeah. pretty good. <laughs> it, if it's something that I enjoy. Yeah. I, I definitely yeah. found that makes a big difference. I know. Right. Like talking about bikes is so, or bike packing and nature and all that, you know, it's like, man, this is just fun. Like I look yeah. forward to interviews. I'm like, oh man, I'm going to learn something today. I get to talk to somebody else who's just as excited and nerdy about all these things like I am, it's which so is awesome. why I started. It's like, I just, the, w the way I started was like, I started an Instagram account just so I could be a bike nerd. Like, I, you know, and like a, just hang out with other bike nerds on the internet and completely let my freak flag fly. And then it evolved into a podcast where I can just like talk to people about bikes. And I think that's so awesome. <laughs> it's fun, man. Yeah. It's like, I don't know. It's the best thing. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. The problem is I'm, I've been enjoying it so much. I haven't been riding my bike as much oh, lately. Oh no! So I had to like, uh, I had to kick my own ass and like get things in gear. I'm like, dude, come on. Um, you know, you gotta be like, I don't know. I'm trying to find that balance. You know, it's always about like, you know, balance. You got yeah. work, family, you got to ride your bike. I mean, really enjoying the podcast and all that. And so I want to, I want to do it, but I just got to, yeah. It's one more ball to juggle. Yes. You yeah. Know? But it's, it's a good ball and I'm glad to be juggling it. I think it's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you. I yeah. appreciate that. Uh, all right. So you talk a lot about, um, riding solo. Can you, I mean, number one, why There's let's not... start, let's start there. Why? Why solo? Um, well, not many people that I know can just kind of say, oh, I'm going to go out on a trip this week, you know? So that's, that's a lot to do with it, but I really do value my alone time. I do yeah. too. It's, yeah. it's like, uh, it's a chance to disconnect from the world and reconnect with myself and just, it's, it's like a meditation. Wow. Yeah. That's so funny. I said those exact same words yesterday. Oh yeah. Disconnect from the world and reconnect with myself. Yeah. I mean, yeah. something, I mean, identical to that, but I mean, you hit it. I mean, that's exactly what it is. And I, I like riding with people sometimes, but a lot of times I find like the bike is, man, I just want to go and have that therapy, that bike therapy and wilderness therapy. Yeah. And yeah, helps put things in perspective. And then when I have a little dance party on the bike, it's not quite as embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> what does a dance party on a bike look like? I don't know, you just kind of move around a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the other day I was came up on a crest and it was just this long, beautiful gravel downhill and I was listening to Tom Petty and it was the chorus and it was I'm free fallen. Yeah. Like right as I came over the top of the hill, I was like, oh, this is perfect. <laughs> yeah. So you're a woman and you're riding solo I think it's important that you talk about maybe the safety side of it, because as I've done this, I've learned by talking to other women that there's concerns and not, and being a man, I'm probably ignorant to a lot of them. Um, so yeah, like how, what, 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 what are some concerns you're aware of and how do you deal with them? Yeah. So that's, that's a, pretty loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Um, <clears throat> I do. I, I get that question a lot. Yeah. Um, you just kind of learn how to read people. Um, I think as women, we are already kind of aware of that and more in tune with it maybe. Right. Um, and on top of that, you just kind of, maybe you don't give out as much information. You know, I, I one of the most frequent questions I get is, well, where are you staying? Well, mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you following me. So, you know, stuff like that. You just kind of, yeah. you have to learn to, I guess, dodge questions sometimes. Or, you know, one of the, one of the things also, if I'm um, approached by someone and I act scared, like that can offend them, which can lead to an escalation. Mm -hmm. But if I'm more confident in myself and my surroundings and in talking with them, it, it opens the door for dialogue. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've met a lot of really nice people that way. So the, if I've let fear control me, then I feel like that honestly puts me into kind of some different situations than if I recognize that fear and kind of address it myself. Yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, even myself, uh, I remember, I was doing that event and it was like two 30 in the morning. I was standing in front of a church, just like, I don't, I was looking, looking at maps and eating a snack and 
trying to plan my life for the next few hours and some guy rolls up in an old Chevy truck and like, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. And I was feeling escalated on the inside. I'm like, okay, it's two something in the morning. I'm in the middle of nowhere. And it's just a a weird situation. You know, you're like, okay, how is this going to go? But I, I remember that moment, like kind of the same thing you're talking about, just trying to be like, don't start it off escalated, you know, like yeah. start it off like, hey, man, yeah, I'm just out here riding my bike. I know I'm crazy, you yeah, know, yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. And hopefully they respond in kind because right. um, I didn't want to hit that spot tracker, you know, come and get me button. I mean, I had my finger on it, but I didn't yeah. want to have to use it. Yeah. And that's that's a, a lot of it, too, is just kind of before I go out on a trip. Okay, like a mental checklist. I've, if if I get, find myself in a situation, like what are my options? Mm-hmm. What do I have with me? What I can, what can I do? You know, that spot tracker is a, a great kind of security blanket, but it won't prevent something from happening. So yeah. I really believe that the best thing is just preventing situations in the first place. So Do you carry like mace or anything like that? Mm, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah, it, it kind of depends on where I am. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, I care. I mean, whether it's for dogs or people, I don't know. It's just uh, something I've always uh, packed on there because um, you never know. Have you had any, like, sketchy situations? Yeah. Can you talk about it? Yeah. Uh, probably, like, one of the most recent ones. I was in this little campground in Oklahoma that was pretty backwoods. And uh, they had this, it was a weird, it was like an off-road park. And I was staying there because I was scouting a route through Oklahoma. And they had this little, like, bar that was there. And there was a gentleman there that was pretty well in. Yeah. And uh, He'd been there a while. Yeah, he'd been there a while. <laughs> and, you know, was really interested in talking to me a lot. And then he had to go to the bathroom. And it was like my opportunity to escape, but I had to take the back way to my campground instead of just going straight to my campground because mm-hmm. I didn't want him to, you know, see where I was going. So it goes back to the, like, those are the things that women have to kind of yeah. focus on more that maybe some men, it's not as prevalent to them. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, it's just not something that we, I have to, I've ever had to deal with. Yeah. I mean, that one, in, that's the only instance. The one I just shared is the only time I can ever think about where I was like, okay, this is sketchy. And it was totally fine. He was like, what are you doing? You know And I mean? It was totally fine, but it was also like, I was thinking through my options, Mm -hmm. like what, okay, you know? And so it sounds like you just have a much more well-prepared list of contingencies. Like it's something you're just aware of and. Yeah, I I had, my, my childhood wasn't necessarily the greatest. And so maybe that in the long run has helped me kind of be a little more aware and prepared yeah. for things. So, so yeah. it's a benefit. <laughs> yeah. Nice way to put a positive spin on a rough childhood. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I'm always positive too. I'm like a glass half full of everything. It's like, I mean, I don't know. Life is weird, right? I mean, you're sitting here right now. Are you happy? Like, you know, yeah. everything's good. You got the drink in your hand and, mm-hmm. you know, like, so you could like complain about all the things that like, oh, my life was this, but yeah, but they le- all led up to this right. You know, right here and they informed who I am. And exactly. So I don't know. It's, I, I'm, I'm the same way. I, I'm just like, you know, I mean, yeah, but I learned from it, you know, yeah. like that. I didn't die, did I? I didn't die. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I didn't. That's a great one. I didn't, I didn't die. Yeah. <laughs> How'd you do on an event, a race? Ah, uh, I didn't die. So yeah. I came out and I learned something. So, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm one. All right. Well, let's uh, let's lighten it up a little bit. I I think that's really important though, and I'm I'm, I'm thank you for sharing that because I think there's a lot of people that would probably ben- benefit from that. And I kind of want to. I have a wife and two daughters, and I, I really want to be aware of these things so that when we go and do trips, I can be more informed myself mm-hmm. and be looking out and all. You know, what um, let's talk about the gear. Okay. I'll tell you real briefly. So my wife rides an extra small salsa Fargo. Okay. Finding bags that fit it, finding a seat bag that will, or saddle bag that'll go on the back and have enough clearance. I had to take hers from a 29er to a 27.5 and then went through three different seat bags. Um, yeah. Like what, uh, what have you figured out 
as a, cause what, what size do you write a small? A small. Yeah. yeah. So what, maybe you could talk about your setup and what you've learned because the industry is not super. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I know exactly what you're saying. And it's, I'm, yeah, go ahead. It's, um, so I, I kind of call myself a weight weenie in reality. It's out of necessity because the generally the lighter weight items are smaller. So like I do run an ultralight tent mostly because it packs down small. Mm. You know, I, I do run, I pick, I pick my gear. I'd say mostly based on how small it'll pack down because I can't run a large frame bag. I can't run a large seat bag. You know, right. I'm, I'm, unless I run that bindle, I'm limited to the nine liter tail bag, you know, and the, the, at most maybe the medium front roll, you know? So that goes back to the, maybe I trim my kit down too much at a certain point, okay, but I, yeah. that was out of necessity, you know? So you kind of, you know, learn how to adapt to that. So what is your set, set up uh, a seat bag, a frame bag, a front roll? Yes. Do you do anything on the forks, anything on your back? Um, the only thing I carry, if I can avoid it, I will never carry anything on my back. Um, but I have a little, like a hip pack, uh, the three liter race pack. Oh yeah. Um, but I carry, you know, my mirrorless camera an extra lens, you know, stuff. I carry some of that in there, my wallet, you know, stuff like that. So what, what have you, like, what good advice can you give women that are looking because a lot, a lot of them are maybe shorter in stature. And I know whenever I was on the uh, Big Ben trip with like 16 uh, students, um, almost all all the girls were struggling with, you know, frame bag or uh, the bags were rubbing on their tires or yes. like all that kind of. So like, I don't have you like learned anything where you can like give some good pointers on? Yeah. So even just this past weekend, I was riding with another lady and she had that exact same problem, the, the Terrapin um, seat harness mm -hmm. um and just the little things like really learning your equipment so just moving the buckles to the next little uh daisy chain loop mm. up so that it angles your bag higher so it's right. not sticking straight out back and then sagging yeah. just little things like that just like i told her just open a bottle of wine one night and start <laughs> playing around with you know packing your bags and you know, the, the weight distribution is a big thing. So yeah. like not having all the heavier items towards the tail end of your tail bag so that it won't sag, right. you know, put all that towards the seat post, right. Or, uh, in your frame bag, like keep, keep your center of gravity lower stuff, stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. It's just trial and error. Yeah. I love that. <clears throat> uh, so much of this is just like, tinkering in your garage or opening a bottle of wine and like mm -hmm. figuring something out. It's one of the really neat things about the sport is, I mean, it's an adventure from the second you decide, Hey, I want a bike pack. Okay, great. Well, how am I going to get all this crap on my bike? Yeah. <laughs> how do yeah. I use all this stuff? And do I really need, do I really need all of it? Yeah. That's, that's one of the big things that I've found when I'm kind of guiding people and helping them through stuff. Like, you know, do you, do you really need a fresh, jersey to ride tomorrow like <laughs> you don't have to you can if you want but yeah. you know just that's gonna take up space and you're gonna stink in five minutes anyways so <laughs> yeah no that's great i remember when i was getting into it i'm like D so are people carrying like extra jerseys and extra shorts and like nope and a lot of times we just sleep in those shorts too <laughs> it's like you know it's gonna get nasty in the morning anyway and yeah. so same like, socks same socks yeah no shower like <laughs> run what you brung yep yeah. No, that's, yeah, I think that's good for people to hear. Like, I mean, there's not a school that people can go to and like learn all this stuff. And yeah. so the adventure begins, like really whenever you decide, I want to, I want to do this. Like, it's yeah. just, a lot of it is just in my backyard or in the garage, like tinkering around. Um, and you can, you can find a, someone's packing list from a trip that they went on. Um, I know a lot of people want to be able to just find that list and a link to Amazon and go buy it all and then yeah. they're done. But the way that person uses their equipment is going to be totally different from the way you use the equipment. And right. maybe, maybe their conditions are different than what you're going to experience. So kind of going into that, I think it's a good way to start into it, but it's, it's not the end all be all like there's, there's other aspects yeah. to it. That's true. I learned a lot from looking at other people's list as well, but I don't, um, I don't focus too much on the gear in terms of you should, you should ride this bike or you should use this. 
this is what works for me, but the only way I figured it out was just through trial and error. So I'm, Absolutely. I'm much more of, I, I try to promote like go in your backyard or ride to a local park, you know, that's 10 miles away and you can call your wife or your husband or whatever to come get you if something goes wrong. Like, yeah. you know, just like baby steps, you know, and like figure out what you need, what you didn't need and, and kind of go from there. Oh, we were talking about the equipment and I wanted to, um, it seems like the biggest uh, issue with women's bikes is not only like the frame space is a limiting factor. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I don't know. I got a custom bag for my wife's salsa Fargo and it'll, it does. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, the seat bag where you really depend on it to carry like a lot of stuff. She only has five and a half inches of clearance. So what seat bag have you found or mm. seat bags? Um, that's a tough one. I run, it's the Revelate. I also have a, a custom bag from Nuclear Sunrise out of El Paso. Um, but they're the small, just nine liter bags. Yeah, I, I started out, you know, with the 14 liter full size bag and it just, no matter what I did, it didn't work. Yeah. Um, on the Pony Express last year, I needed that extra space. And so the bindle rack came in. What is play. that like a, I don't even know what that is. <clears throat> Yeah, so it's Portland Design Works. Um, it's basically like a rack that clamps to your seat post and then comes out. And it's, it's a, I think it's just aluminum tubing. Maybe it's steel. I'm not real sure. Um, and it holds like the Terrapin dry bag in there, kind of slides in. Oh. Yeah, so it, it prevents things from like slapping up and down or, yeah. or moving around too much. Okay. Yeah, that's a good tip. What it, where I finally landed with my wife's was on the uh, uh, porcelain rocket Mister Fusion Mini. Okay. And the way the reason I like that is, have you used it or? Familiar? No, I haven't used it, okay. but I'm I'm familiar with yeah, it. Yeah, it, it's the one that has the frame that attaches to the seat post, and so you can like crank that down, and it's yeah. not going to go down any further. Yeah. You know, and so like that's that system is the only one I could find that worked for her. Um, and she only has like half an inch of clearance, you yeah, know? Yeah, so and, I think it's gnarly. It's kind of... Yeah, yeah, it's kind of... I mean, you can... See, yeah, it's not a lot of clearance, but I, I'm, I'm going to put this out there again. I've said it before, but we need bike bag manufacturers and makers to like cater more towards the smaller stature. Whether I mean, there's guys that are five foot tall, you know, yeah. like there just aren't a lot of great options out there. I, so. I have a few women on the, the team that I used to race with mm -hmm. that like they they've spent two years looking for a gravel bike that'll fit them they they want to go ride gravel but right. they can't find a bike that, right. that even fits them you know like much, much less the gear yeah. so yeah it's definitely an issue yeah and it's so crazy too because everybody recognizes women as the largest growth opportunity in the sport um i mean the the numbers are just way skewed towards men mm -hmm. whether it's equipment bags and also participants but part of that is like we have this whole untapped market over here of people that want women who want to go and do this and there just aren't isn't the support so for whatever it's worth i'm putting it out there again we need more people <laughs> making women specific or like not even men like just stuff for like smaller. low smaller yeah yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I'm, I'm six foot two and so like that's you're so lucky I, i'm lucky <laughs> in that way yeah like but uh but i like I've, I've learned about it from my wife who's five one or five yeah. two she's five two we'll give her five two five two she'll be happy i said five two <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i mean i'm like i'm going through i'm i spent countless hours on the internet like researching 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 trying to find yeah. like how do i have a wife that wants to go bike packing and wants to go but how do i get yeah all the gear on her bike it's like a real problem i've, I've been on trips you know as as a female i've been on plenty of trips where i'm the only female and i hear a lot of these guys talk about how they wish they could you know bring their wives or well if you don't have the gear available then like they can't even try it. Yeah. So if they can't even try it, they won't even know. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, let's put that out there and hope someone's listening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned that you lead some trips. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So I, I going back to the women, like there are, I found that a lot of 
women seem to want to try it, but you know, maybe it's a little intimidating because it is so male dominated. Mm -hmm. Um, so it seems like they maybe are, it's easier to talk to me about it. I'm not real sure, but um yeah they don't want to get mansplained maybe maybe that's what that's like a real problem (laughs) yeah yeah so we here honey let me show you how to fix that yeah shut up (laughs) (laughs) it makes me mad when i hear guys yeah i'm just like anyway (laughs) it happens it it does happen it's got to be so frustrating it is it is especially like for you who knows like shut (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah i've i've had plenty of instances like i'll, I'll show up to gravel events where we, there's a bikepacking event and that's happening in conjunction with it and, yeah and they just think i'm there you know super terrified to go out on this gravel ride and i have all these bags on my bike in case something happens it's like no i'm i'm spending the night out you know and they're like oh well that's i think that's really awesome that you're doing mm, that good like, for you oh well thank you <laughs> <laughs> i mean i guess i guess that's nice but I, yeah, it's like patronizing. It, yeah, it can be. I, yeah. I, I try to have the okay, like they're they're just trying to be nice. Yeah, you know, mentality. Yeah. But sometimes it's hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would definitely be hard for me. I'd be like, dude, shut up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I'm not as nice as you are, probably. Well, I don't know. <laughs> it depends on how hard the day was before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, anyway, I got distracted or uh, detracted from. Uh, you were talking about uh taking women out and yeah it's more you're more approachable which i i mean obviously like if i was a woman or my wife i'm like i you you could give her more advice than i can you know i'm sitting here asking you questions Mm -hmm. because i don't know i'm not a woman i I think it is hard as a female like how do i approach a guy and say well what do you are you comfortable at going to a state park on your own yes you know like that that's something that i don't think crosses a lot of guys minds it didn't until not too long ago yeah Yeah. so little little things um and honestly i guess it wouldn't i don't want to say this it hadn't always been top on my radar but since doing this more, I've definitely paid more attention to it and realized that I'm already doing these things. So, like, if I show up to a state park um, after hours, let's say, and, you know, I'm not real comfortable, it's dark, well, I, I'm going to find that spot next to the camp host mm. and camp there yeah. instead of, you know, going off at the end of the road, you know, where no one knows I'm there, right? right? So I've had instances that I've shown up at state parks, um, it's been freezing cold and lo and behold the camp host used to tour on bicycles you know and they're like here we'll set up a chair for you we'll get the fire going you go get a shower we'll have all this ready for you and they just you know it's amazing what you find when when that happens so yeah so are you doing Mm -hmm. uh like organized trip like i I guess if, if there's a woman who's interested in like going on a trip and learning from you is there somewhere that they can go to yeah yeah so i've partnered with Kevin Lee of Spinistry. Okay. Uh, he's uh, based out of North Texas, does a lot of gravel events. Um, he does stuff in North Texas, Central Texas. We're kind of expanding a little bit, Colorado, some Oklahoma stuff. Oh, cool. Yeah, so we're just trying to get some options out there because maybe not everyone wants to ride in Central Texas. Maybe it's too far for them, or maybe Colorado is really interesting to them for whatever yeah. reason, you know. Um, so, yeah, if, if they're interested, definitely they can reach out to me directly on Facebook, Instagram, whatever, uh, or uh, find the spinistry. Uh, I think it's the spinistry.com, dot net. I'm not real sure. I think it's dot com. Dot com. Yeah. <laughs> I should know that. There's only one spinistry. Yeah, yeah. Well, in this day and age, like you just type it in and it pops up and. Yeah, the spinistry gravel ride. You yeah. Know, then yeah. you'll find it. So, yeah. yeah. So, if the, 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 and he'll post like events and, and yeah, we're trying, workshops and stuff. We're definitely trying to um, kind of put more of them out there. Just it. Even if there's just one person that bites and wants to go on a trip, like that's great. Let's go. One yeah. of the one of the big things that we've found is it's the social aspect. Like that's that's what people are, I guess, a little hesitant on. They don't have anyone to go with, right? Mm. Like they may have all their bike buddies, but those bike buddies aren't interested in bike packing. Right. But they really are, and they want to do this. And so having these organized trips that that aren't just a spur of the moment type thing like they're planned and there's a planned route and there's maybe someone there that knows what they're doing so if you're new to this you don't have to face as much of that intimidation like right. there's, there's kind of a we're, we're trying to lower the barrier 
for right. more people to get involved. Oh, yeah. There's people there you can lean on and know what they're doing. And yeah. You're not going to get in over your head. And if you do, yeah. someone can help you out. Yeah. What, uh, what have you experienced, like, doing those events and watching new people be introduced to the sport? Like, what has that been like from your perspective? It's been awesome. It's been really awesome. So one of the things that I've definitely um, recognized is, you know, our, our, our lives are pretty much routine, right? Most people, you know, Monday through Friday go to work, wake up in the morning, they have a routine, they go to work, they have a routine, they come home, they have a routine. And if something is thrown into that, that kind of puts a kink into things, it kind of sends anxiety through the roof for, for a lot of people, mm -hmm. not, not everyone. Um, but then you take them out on these bikepacking trips where it doesn't matter how much you plan, something will go wrong. And it, it doesn't have to be catastrophic. It can be, you know, I'm bonking. I don't ever bonk. You know, why am I bonking? Right. So helping them work through those issues and watching them realize, Oh, like I'm good. I, I made it through this mm -hmm. and I actually had a really good time and yeah. I'm going back to work kind of in a reset, mm. you know, even if it's just a 24 hour trip or sub 24, right. Just being able to disconnect because we have so much going on in our daily lives back home that I almost feel like at a certain point it's, it's a necessity to just walk away for just a short period of time and regather, regroup. Yeah. And then you come back and I feel like that sub 24 hour trip can carry you for a month or two, you know, you can't carry me that long. But well, yeah. <laughs> some people, for some people it can. No, I, yeah. no, I, uh, I, I, I get what you're saying. I, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I relate a hundred percent to that. Like it's, it's not, it's a necessity, like the way you, yes. you said it. I, I just realized in my life that this isn't like an optional thing. Like if I'm not doing it, then like I'm not as happy. You yeah, know, like and the it, people around me aren't. They're, <laughs> they're, they're suffering the consequences of that. <laughs> yes, my wife has 100% told me, like, go ride your bike. Yeah. Like if I'm grown, should, you need to leave the house right now and go ride your bike. And I'm like, hmm. Seems like good advice. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll do that. Yeah, it, it took me a long time to figure that out, how important that is. Yeah. Have you seen anyone cry yet? Oh, yes. Like, I mean, happy, cried. Happy, happy, <laughs> happy tears, not... Actually, yeah, yeah. Um, more of the one-on-one -on -one type stuff. So that, you know, just simple experiences where um, maybe not physical tears, but I had a lady that I... I had taken out and was guiding her on her first gravel ride and bikepacking trip and yeah. she hadn't ever really camped right so it was like the trifecta and we saw like some buzzards you know um flying well it was a windy day and you know she was concerned that maybe there was something dead it's like well no if you watch them watch what they're doing and see this this like incline here and they're surfing the wind currents and then from that point on she was just every time she saw it she was just grinning from ear to ear because she realized that yeah. oh no they're playing they're having <laughs> fun it's not because something died you yeah. know yeah. so like that change in perspective and then like from that point on it was just watching the it, it it's like it opened her up right to accept the experiences have you uh how or how maybe how i'm sure you've seen how how often are you seeing like you take someone on a trip and it just like clicks with them you know you're like oh man this yeah. is what i was missing yeah yeah um this last weekend yeah <laughs> one of those yeah yeah she had she'd come out on a trip before um but then this she came out again this last weekend and it was just the two of us and we were sitting there at the campground and she just was like I, thank you like this is amazing this is i need i need this in my life i need to do this yeah. i need to figure out how to make this happen yeah so i love that man yeah. that's part of the best part about yeah I, there's something so much fun of watching somebody open their horizon and their perspective to like a new reality you yeah. know, like I, I got to experience it. I was interested to hear your answer because I got to experience it for the first time um, on that big Ben trip. That was a that was a great that trip. I, awesome. I, I reference it all the time. Um, I, mean, I, I bet those kids were. God, 
like <laughs> it was, it's the same thing as like you're talking about like three of them had never camped before one of them had never ridden a bike until four months prior to the event wow. we were talking about like greenhorns you know yeah. they're going out and you're familiar with big ben ranch state park yes. so you know the kind of terrain we did the 100 mile epic loop including the solitario nice. um with you know, five days in the desert with Just throwing six, them at the fire. huh? Yeah, I didn't do it. Jared did, but I went along for the ride. Yeah. But what I saw was like the most impressive display of like humans, like just being adaptable and overcoming challenges. I mean, one girl like hit her, like went over bars and hit her face and like bit through her lip and she was like squirting water out of it, it was, yeah <laughs> one girl wrecked 44 times i saw that in the video yeah <sighs> it was so it was so awesome watching like you could see just the light in their eyes that's the thing you know? is they were none of that was discouraging yeah none of the wrecks none of the mechanicals none of the you know the rain or the wind that like all the all the things that mother nature is going to throw at you didn't phase them a bit when yeah. I, what I love about that is what I've learned now I take back to my daily life. And when shit hits the fan, yeah. I have those tools now exactly. to fall back on. And I have that confidence. And like the things that used to really bug me and would, you know, I'd be having a great day and then something would happen and it would ruin the rest of my day. Like that doesn't happen anymore. Mm. You know, I, I, I'm. All right. Uh, that's embarrassing. I just, uh, my memory card just got full so we're <laughs> we kind of got cut off and we're gonna pick it back up again yeah do you remember where we were <laughs> yeah um just the life skills that you watch people realize that they've had all along you know it's it's they're relearning those life skills um remembering them as i, I feel like everyone's had those at some point you know it's just life gets busy you get kind of involved in everything and you kind of forget some stuff you know yeah. So you're like, you forget you're a badass. Well, yeah, you forget you're capable of doing a lot more than you realize. That's a more eloquent way to say it. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> so yeah, it's, I think that's one of the most, most rewarding aspects of guiding people. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, I mean, that's one thing that I've thought a lot about is that just as humans, we're capable of so much and whether it's like a personal experience that you've had or just the fact that you're human and you just haven't put yourself in the position to find out mm -hmm. how capable you really are. Yeah. And that, yeah, I enjoy, I enjoy that for myself as well as watching it, other people overcome stuff. Like that's, that's just a very empowering understanding to have of your own capabilities. Cause yeah. like we were talking about how you take that back to your daily life and you're like, I mean, I've done some pretty hard stuff. Like, I think I can handle this. I don't know. This deadline client for work or, or something. Yeah, you know, this, yeah. You know, or whatever the flat on the the tire went flat on a car or something. You're like, yeah. oh, I gotta, like, whatever. I mean, mechanicals are just a part of life. You know, it's just yeah. it's just easy to help put things in perspective in like your daily life. Whenever you know that, yeah, you can you're capable of a lot of stuff. You know, mm -hmm. how much how much of the um, natural world is a is a motivator for you on these trips oh a ton outside of just the bike but yeah a ton i just i love watching nature the the more you the more you see it the more you pick up on just little things and you watch how just animals behave you yeah. know and you're like oh well that makes total sense yes that, like they're not they're not doing that just out of habit like there's a reason for that you right. know and and then the more you're out there, the more you see, right? So the more you kind of become in tune with things that are happening, the more you'll see the, the little lizard, right? So getting into bikepacking, you know, we're, we're facing a lot of fears, right? So snakes, that was a big, big thing for me. I've, I've always appreciated snakes, but from a distance, from a distance, <laughs> right? So over the last few years, I took it upon myself to learn to identify snakes and that's really helped it's yeah. it's it's given me a sense of control in an uncontrollable world <laughs> but you know like just this this last trip in the last two days i saw five rat snakes and a king snake you know but i was able to identify them yeah and, and you know those are non-pointers in this non, non venomous non non venomous <laughs> yeah they will uh yeah and the leave king, them alone a king snake eats 
other venomous snakes. Yeah, they so do. So like, you know, I'm you like, like them. I'm like, good. big thumbs up, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you keep going. Yeah, that's a that's an important one. Yeah, knowledge is power. Mm-hmm. I mean, it and actually speaking of knowledge is power, I wanted to ask you about wilderness. Uh, you're WADA certified? Yeah, the Advanced survival. First Aid, Wilderness Advanced First Aid. Ah, Advanced yeah. First Aid. Yeah. Nice. I definitely recommend it. it at a minimum, the two-day course, the Wilderness First Aid course put on by Knowles. Uh, you can go on the Knowles website and look that up, yeah. or um, many times REI will will have those classes. What kind of stuff are they teaching you in those classes? So it's just how to, if you come upon an incident, just... It's, it's all about kind of maintaining your composure, um, gathering information, uh, learning how to keep the, the patient comfortable. Um, most of the time, it's not you know a life or death situation, but it can be really scary for the person you come across. And so yeah. if you have the knowledge, it helps you stay calm, which helps them stay calm. Right, right. So Instead of being, oh, there's blood everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> oh my gosh, you're squirting water out of your lip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm, I'm really, um, I really want to take that class. Yeah. I think my Boy Scout merit badge and first aid probably only goes so far. Like, yeah. I, I feel like I could probably benefit. Like, if you're going to be going and doing like some adventures in just rural places, like we're talking yeah. about Big Ben, like yes, having some backcountry first aid uh, knowledge, yeah, is like yeah, it, it's like a no brainer. But I, I feel like there's not as many people that have that certification as probably should. Yeah, and it, it is time consuming. Like the the wilderness first aid class, it's a two day, you know, sixteen hour weekend class. So not everyone can, at, when they offer it, can take that full weekend off um yeah. the advanced first aid was a a uh, five-day class right so that was in big bend wasn't it it was in big bend yeah, yeah. It, it, that was awesome <laughs> <laughs> if you're if you're interested in taking one i definitely recommend taking some time to go down there and take it from from yeah. that speaking of big Ben, what's your favorite place to go ride hmm one of mine is Big Bend, if not the so and i know you've spent a lot of time there as well yeah but yeah i mean you've traveled far and wide do you have do you have a favorite i am partial to the the american west yeah it's i love the high desert yeah it's it's so it's so rugged and so remote and just you can get on the top of a mountain and see for miles you know your your view right. is not encumbered by trees yes. you know and then you realize that people have been living here for a long time and here i am on a bicycle with all this modern technology right. and, you know, riding through this and, and you're roughing it and You're i'm like, roughing it i'm yeah. not no i'm not yes <laughs> so yeah. it's it's a very humbling experience you're just visiting that world people lived in it yeah you know and thrived in it yes yeah yeah it really is humbling going back to like putting things in perspective mm-hmm. yeah i i agree i think high desert is is my my favorite I mean, it's and, Big and Bend. <laughs> the, yeah, Big Bend, I mean, is a perfect example. I mean, and, and the views you get, whether it's a sunrise or sunset, you can see so far, and then the night sky. Oh, the stars. It just, it's killer. I, I love to ask people this question. Uh, what's better at Big Bend, daytime or nighttime? I think nighttime. Yeah. Yeah. It's that That's special. Yeah. The, the night skies in Big Bend are unbelievable, and especially if the moon hasn't you know risen mm-hmm. yet and there's a meteor shower going on i mean i could i could lay there all night and just stare at the stars and yeah it's amazing i've definitely woken up sleep sleep deprived the next morning because i've just spent all night just staring at the stars kind of getting lost and man those are all stars those are all like little suns or you know oh there goes the space station or, yeah <laughs> you know there's the someone up way. there you see the milky way really well yeah yeah it's yeah those are the kinds of experiences that when people have them for the first time i mean yeah it changes lives i saw it you know yeah. big ben i mean it's just like oh my gosh this is out here you know i'm this little speck on this little speck (laughs) (laughs) amongst all these other little specks (laughs) man that's a weird train of thought because then you can be like okay i'm i'm insignificant 
you can make yourself extremely insignificant yeah. if you spend too much time thinking about it. Then you're like, well, what's the purpose of any of this? <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, you've been there? I I'm have sure been there. Anyone who's stared at the night sky in Big Ben for long enough, I'm sure, is like, has gone through a similar oh, yeah. you know, thought process. I think everyone should go through it. <laughs> I think they should. Yeah, you need to. And it puts it helps put life in perspective. Like, yeah. Whatever happens, you're like, okay. This really is like not a big deal. I'm not a big deal. You're not a big deal. The situation isn't a big deal. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I, I I love that perspective. And that's one of the reasons we were talking about the necessity of going outside. It's that part of it is the necessity of reconnecting with that idea of chill, man. It's yeah. going to be fine. You're just a little speck. That's all you are. Yeah. Like, don't take yourself too seriously. The sun's still going to rise. It really is. It doesn't. <laughs> oh, and that's another thing when you're in the wilderness and it doesn't give a fuck about you. Yeah. Like you. You're, you're, a, you're definitely a guest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It doesn't care about you at all. And you realize how, how small. And, yeah. I love it. All that stuff. Yeah. I could talk about that for hours, but I know. Uh, Might yeah. run out of memory again. I know. I'm already on memory <laughs> card number two. All right. So let's. Uh, Let's talk about Pony Express route. Yeah. Is this like your own passion project? You had the idea for it. Tell yeah. It, yeah. Where did that come from? So going back to previous comments about, you know, getting out in the desert completely underprepared, running out of water, being 40 miles from the nearest paved road and having to hit the help button for my husband to come find me. Yeah. Um, I, came out of that situation and realized, no, I, I want to ride through, you know, Utah and Nevada and started kind of looking at roads and I was looking at maps. I'm kind of a map nerd. I, lo I love just sitting for hours and staring at maps. Paper or digital? Uh, both. Okay. Yeah. So I started to look at like BLM maps and then I saw where it said like the original Pony Express and it was a line. I was like, wait a second. So I went online and you know zoomed in on satellite mm -hmm. oh it, it's like there's a trail still there and what? started doing a bunch of research and realized that wait a second I, like they still re-ride the pony express every year it's like a big caravan um, by horse or by horse okay. yeah they they recreate the route um well if they can do it on a horse surely i can do it you know and it turns out most of it goes through blm land uh it's open for bikes you can go out there and wild camp you know and so i said okay let's let's put this together and then i was um when was that that was probably i guess three years ago wow. so right right after i had kind of gotten into bike packing so were you, I, were you surprised that nobody else had yeah identified that yeah yeah i really was i um this was let's see i guess a year after that i went and did the baja divide and oh, cool. kind of met up with Nick and Lale. And did you? Yeah. Did you do that, the inaugural ride? Yes. Or, yeah. yeah. Oh, that man, that was an amazing experience. Oh. <laughs> that, that honestly, it was life changing. Yeah. I feel like that, that experience is what kind of set me on this path. Well, why? So, that, you can't say life changing and then, yeah. Like what happened on that trip? What was uh, like? Just eye opening, you know, like there's this whole other world out there. I had, it, it was Mexico. So of course everyone, especially here in Texas, is like, Oh, you don't want to go to Mexico. It's dangerous. It's not <laughs> safe. And especially as a single female, you know, and one day in, I was like, this is, that's, that's all just hype, you know? Like, yeah, sure. There's dangerous places, but there's dangerous places here, you yeah, know? Yeah. So the guy we, got shot <clears throat> about a half mile from here. Yeah. Like, and killed yeah like, yeah anyway it, it happens you know I, I you could walk out your front door and lightning could strike That's so a, it's a it's an important perspective because people talk about fears but it's like man what are you gonna do sit around all day and like yeah. sit on your thumbs because you're afraid of everything yeah and i got i got tired of that i got tired yeah. of letting it Being a prisoner to dictate that. how i was gonna live my life yeah so went down there and um just kind of mentioned it and I was really surprised at the number of people who were like, no, like you need to make that a route. And I, I had just mapped it for my own purpose, you know? And I talked to a bunch of people and they were gung ho about it. And I was like, okay, well now it kind of took on its own own life. So I had to- Now you told people about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> told people about it and had to kind of try and make it a little more official. And yeah, and like, oh, I, I need to actually verify that it is a route that goes through and not did you pick Lael and nick's uh, brain on on the baja divide a little bit 
a little yeah. bit. Yeah, I didn't ride with them a whole whole lot, um, but just other people that I found myself riding with, you know, mm-hmm. just talking to them about it. And then over the years, you know, like going to the bikepacking summit and talking to, you know, way more experienced bikepackers about, you know, there's one section as you leave Salt Lake City and you make your way to Austin, Nevada. It's 400 miles and only about the first 200 has water. There's no food resupply in that mm. 400 miles. So if you want food, you have to drop down 30 miles off the route one way. Okay. So, you know, how do you, how do you map that? How do you route that? You know, cause there are some people that can do that. Right. They, they know they're comfortable taking that on. There's a lot of people that aren't. So like, do I map it to just ride straight through and let people figure that out on their own? Or do I map it? Okay. No, you go down here and come back up. Yeah. What did you do? Um, that's something I'm still debating. Yeah. You know, it's, I think you just, I mean, my, my thought is just like, make a note, be like, Hey, yeah. you know, it's 400 miles, 200, only, only 200 has water. Yeah. There's a supply here if you need it, you yeah. know, and just make it available. Yeah. Maybe. It's, it's, but I've never created a route. So it's hard because I, I, the last thing I want is to find out that someone maybe didn't do their research and got out there and got into a lot of trouble. For sure. You know, yeah. so I, 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 I don't know how I would handle that. <laughs> That's a really good point, man. Yeah. Like you're, you're laying, you're putting something out there. Other people are going to go ride it mm-hmm. based on the beta that you provided. Yeah, that's heavy. And there's a lot of people that really aren't aware that there is still that much wilderness in this country that right. you can go 400 miles. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's a road, but you may not see someone on that stretch of road for three or four days. God, that's so cool, though. Yeah. I want to go ride it now. <laughs> it's it's awesome. I'm, I'm leaving Wednesday to go kind of that that section, that 800 miles from Salt Lake City to Sacramento again. Yeah. To try and kind of look. There's... If you want to follow the true original route, it's some of it's overgrown, so it's some hike a bike. Otherwise, you can take a detour and go see some really cool petroglyphs. You know, okay. so there's there's lots of options through yeah. there. Yeah. So you had the idea and then started mapping it out. At this point, where? Well, maybe actually, what is the route like? How many miles is it? Where does it start? Where does it finish? And then, yeah. Yeah. Let's start there. So it starts in St. Joseph, Missouri, which was the original starting point for the original Pony Express. Uh, it goes up to Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, up to Casper, Wyoming, and it goes over the original South Pass. So many people will know South Pass from the Divide. So the route does cross the Divide, but you don't go through South Pass City. You go through the original pass that the immigrants had to cross over. Mm-hmm. Um, and it goes that far north because the Rockies in Colorado are pretty much impassable (laughs) by a lot of standards. Um, And then it drops back down to Salt Lake City, goes across uh, through there to Lake Tahoe over to Sacramento. It's about 2,200 miles. And how much is off pavement? Oh, I'd say at least 85%. Oh, nice. Yeah. There's there's some stretches of pavement um, that, I mean, you're kind of in some of the least populated areas of the country. So there's not a lot of traffic. So is it pretty safe in terms of I like think, vehicular traffic? I think so. Yeah. yeah. That's like my biggest thing that I, my wife worries about dogs. I worry about cars. Yeah. Yeah. How are the dogs? Uh, it's pretty remote. So if you run across a dog that <laughs> he's probably hungry. He's probably hungry. <laughs> yeah. Dog dog probably wants that granola bar you're you're snacking on, but yeah. yeah I I haven't had any issues with it. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ridden the entire route? I have ridden I, I can't say that I've ridden the whole route straight through. Uh I guess the whole route isn't technically official yet, but um in parts I have ridden the whole route. Yeah. Well, I kinda jumped ahead. Yeah, I that was one of the questions is like at what stage are you at in the, okay, it's a route, like here yeah. it is, here's a GPX file. Anyone can, like the file's available out there, anyone can go ride it right now. I, I, I feel comfortable with the file that's out there if yeah. people want to do it. And I've marked um, all along the route, there's still historical buildings, like some of the original Pony Express stations, are, they're in ruins. Some of them have been uh, rebuilt. Um, there's markers that you know, designate where the stations were with a little history information on each of them. 
Um, and then I've marked, tried to mark campgrounds, um, like in some of the kind of Kansas, Nebraska areas. Um, and then like bike shops, stuff like that. I've tried to mark all that. So if someone just took the route, uh, the GPS file, they could head out. Yeah. Why? Why, why did you create the route? I mean, in three years, you're still working on, you're about to go head out again. I mean, that's a lot of work. I wanted to write it myself. Um, and last year, um, I had scheduled to go ride and scheduled myself to go ride the whole route. And a week before I headed out, my father passed away from an overdose. Um, and so I kind of had this, oh, like it's a week before I'm leaving. Should I really do this? And talked to my husband about it quite a bit and he was really encouraging. And so I went out and wrote it and it was exactly what I needed. Yeah. And that experience and seeing all of the history that's still there, you know, kind of reconnecting, like we talked about earlier, like, yeah, there's people that lived out here, mm-hmm. you know, and they survived, you know, and they eked out a living and to see all of that and kind of it's it's humbling, you know, and you just I had I had an experience where I came over the top of a pass in Wyoming and just it looks like you're on top of the world, you know, and. I just lost it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> kind of had that someone, if someone had seen it, they probably would have thought I was manic, but <laughs> it was that moment of freedom. Just, I had all this in my past and this is a chance for me to start again. And wow. so that would have never happened if I hadn't have been out there. So yeah, I have a kind of a, it's my baby. <laughs> yeah. So the route's your baby. Yeah. I want, especially after that experience, I can't imagine like now you have like a personal connection with it. Yeah. I just, I'd like, I'd like for other people to experience it, you know, if they have the time. (laughs) What's, what's the plan for that? Like, uh, so you've got a route out there. Like, is there a race or an event that you're going to do? So I'd originally planned to do that this year, but the guiding thing kind of happened. And I realized this is an opportunity for me to kind of chase a dream. Right. And so I, I've pushed back that event, that group start. And I was, Mm -hmm. I was really inspired by like what Nick and Lale did with Baja. You know, it it was just an unofficial, Hey, let's meet at this date at this place and let's go ride. You'll find people and hook up and yeah, we have the same like schedule, same desires with what we want out of this trip and let's just go ride, you know? So I'd, I'd love to see that happen. Um, I realize that it's difficult for people to take that much time off. So the, the nice thing about the route is you can break it up pretty easy. You could, okay. you know, Casper, Wyoming has an airport, Salt Lake City has an airport, and then Sacramento. So like, yeah. you can easily break the route up. Is there like a peak time to ride it? So I think personally uh, this time right now, like late spring. Yeah. <laughs> Um, of course, it's been a little different this year with all the snow that's been happening. Right. Um, but yeah, I, that... Uh, that's the biggest issue is snow and then heat, I guess. So you just yeah. got to find the sweet spot between the two. Yeah, because you're, you're going through so much varied terrain. Right. Right. You know, and especially in the mountains of Nevada, in the middle of the summer, you could get a freak snowstorm. Like, it's not unheard of. Hmm. So you kind of... I don't know that there is a perfect time, but I, I feel like spring, some of the roads... Um, if you wait all summer after everyone's driven on them and it's dried out, they can get really deep and sandy. Mm. So, you know, fall would probably be beautiful, but then you might have more sand. So you may need a plus bike or a fat bike at that point. So, oh, actually, that was my next question. Yeah. What, what do you recommend in terms of bike tire? So the last, uh, this last year when I rode it, I did it on my cutthroat with a Lau fork and a set of two, one Mezcal's. Yeah. Two ones? Yeah. Okay. So so as long as it's not too sandy, you can get away with just a standard mountain bike tire. Yeah. Yeah. What's up with that Lau fork? Oh, I love it. Is it good? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had it a few years now. Um, I got it after attempting the divide and just getting jarred all over the place. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can stay in my arrow bars over washboard so and not miss a beat. Yeah. So the, the uncool penalty... Of the looks. Oh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's taken a while to get used to, like, the look of it, I, which, is, which isn't which is an issue. I'd be happy to um, try one. 
the money side is the part where I, I'm like, eh, this steel fork is fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you're going to ride 2,200 miles, you might want to invest in whatever gear is going to make it as right. enjoyable as possible. Yeah. What else can you tell people about the route that I think that you think they should know, or maybe like get someone stoked to go out there and ride it? Like, if if you are interested in how this country came to be, like I really feel like the Pony Express route can give you kind of a different insight to that. It, it's the route follows the Mormon Trail, the California Trail, and the Oregon Trail. It's all the same route up until a certain point, and then it kind of splits off. It kind of mm. feathers out. So there's there's so much history, and you realize that like there's still wagon ruts out there. You know, really? there's still um, there's a section in in uh, Nebraska outside of Scotts Bluff that there's there's a wagon on the side of the road still. Really? Yeah. It's the, the axle broke, and they just left it. You know, like what there. else? What else can they yeah. do, right? It's there. Wow. It's got a fence around it, but you know, there's unmarked graves. There's stone huts. There's you know, there's markers out there, and you'll be riding along, and it's not just the Pony Express markers. It's the Oregon Trail, the California Immigrant Trail. Um, you'll come through like the the Mormon handcart centers. Like the Mormons crossed the country with handcarts. Mm-hmm. You know, they didn't have Ox. oxen or yeah. horses you know and they walked it <laughs> yeah so i actually uh i actually grew up mormon okay yeah so uh i really like tuned in whenever you said that i'm like oh that's kind of interesting yeah i'm not mormon anymore but um it encompassed a lot i mean obviously my, my childhood and like growing up and all that and so it, it would be like neat for me to go ride it and kind of make those connection and be like, Oh, this is what they did. Yeah. You know, and kind of like connect with that. Cause yeah, that, I mean, yeah, that goes back to like people just being like badasses. Yeah. You know, it's like, I'm here with a bike. I got all this fancy stuff. And like these people just hand carts. Yeah. Just like, hey, let's pull this cart behind us across America <laughs> yeah. in hopes of something better. Yeah. And you didn't have Google where you could do like a five star review hotel and like, <laughs> right? what, what, what are we, what's there when we get there? Yeah. The only thing you're going on is the story that somebody told you. Yeah, or, look for this rock that has this special look to it and yeah. then go left. You know. Yeah, that's cool. That, that makes me kind of, uh, not that I wasn't interested in writing it, but I, I like the historicity aspect of it for sure. I think that's that's really neat. How How hard is the route? I mean, I, I, that's probably a hard question, but I yeah, because like my my perspective and someone who's you know ridden in Patagonia, like to them it might be easy, yeah. you know. But the the resupply out in Utah, and Nevada can be difficult. Um, I I also feel like it is a good route if you have a little bit of experience and you kind of want to grow. Because when you start in in St. Joseph, you're you're riding through farmland, mm. through Kansas and then parts of Nebraska, so it's relatively populated. And then you start to get into Scotts Bluff and stuff kind of thins out a little bit. And you get into Wyoming and it slowly thins out some more. And then you leave Salt Lake City and it's like, oh, like we are in the wilderness now. You yeah. know? So you, you kind of work your way up to it. And, you know, I took six weeks to do that initial ride. Took took days off, you know, and went and saw like Devil's Tower and stuff like that. But you work your way into that stuff and you gain that confidence along the way. And if you aren't feeling it, call it in Salt Lake city or Casper and you know, that's a good idea. Yeah. That, that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. You kind of like work your way into it and you warm up to the idea of 400 miles with no resupply. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how much elevation is there? Do you know? Uh, it's actually not that bad. About 86,000 feet. You You do cross, uh, I yeah, think it's that's like not bad 16 at all. mountain ranges. Uh-huh. Um, and it's all in Nevada. <laughs> the vast majority of that climbing is in Nevada. Wow. So, all right. So, if people want to find out about that, what's the best way for them to yeah, find the file or more information about the route? So, I have a my ride report is um, on Ride with GPS on their ride report page. Uh, I do have a Facebook page for it and a group as well, um, Bike the Pony Express. So you can probably go on there and find that. Uh, yeah. And then the same handle on Instagram where I'm I'm hoping to put up some more photos and stuff. And my goal there is if other people ride it, you know, tag Bike the Pony Express and let's get those pictures out there and so people yeah, can get see people it. excited about it. Yeah. Have you reached out or thought about reaching out to like um, ACA? 
Uh, not ACA. I've I've reached out. Um, of course, bikepacking.com. Yeah, yeah. And then I am a regional advisor for bikepacking routes for Texas. Oh, cool. So cool. I've kind of been in contact with them a little bit as well. So. So maybe we get some more support from. Yeah. One of the big guns in the yeah. industry. Yeah. Because I, I would I would love to have you know um, all the beta out there, the information yeah. about all of it. It's just it's a pretty daunting task. <laughs> How has bikepacking.com responded to that? Uh, they're they're definitely interested. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, once it seems like the criteria, as far as I can tell, is like you know, good route information, um, all the resupplies, all the things we've talked about, mm -hmm. but, and then they want some nice pictures too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like I need, I need to get other people's perspective on the route before I'm really comfortable saying, yeah, you know, like here it is. Cause you know, my view on it, I'm in love with it, but someone right. else may could go out there and hate it. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's good. I guess if you did a, like a group start kind of thing, you'd have, however many people showed up to mm -hmm. be like, Oh man, that was awesome. Or Ooh, we need to work on that or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's cool, man. That's exciting. That's crazy. That's such a huge project. I just got <laughs> done talking to, um, Chuck Campbell who did the Arkansas high country route. Yeah. Um, that one was just released to ACA and that was, he like called ACA and started talking to him about it. He never, he didn't even have a route. He just, it was like an idea that he had and he called them. And then, uh, the state of Arkansas found out that he was like planning this. They, they wound up coming up with like a hundred thousand dollars to, and they paid him to develop this route. Nice. Um, anyway, maybe, maybe something to think about. Yeah. Um, I understand what you're saying. Like, you don't want to like put it out there, put it out there until it gets ready. But you know, some of these organizations could potentially like get involved and like help speed along the process. True. And that, that's what happened to Chuck was like, he was like, I just had this idea. And all of a sudden I'm like, I mean, there's like a hundred grand out there. So like yeah. time to, okay. It's like <laughs> time to stop talking about it and like actually go and like put out some good, good information. Yeah. But that's, I mean, that's so cool that like the industry is like, yeah. Like we'll put some money up. Like we need these kind of yeah. routes because yeah, without routes, it's like, well, what are, where are we going? You know? Well, to your comment earlier, like the number of people from overseas, so on the other side of the pond that are coming over, mm -hmm. right? On when I've been out there riding, the number of people that I've run into that are like, yeah, we don't have any of this space in Europe. Yeah. So we take our month long vacation every year. Like I've met people that buy a truck and store it in California <laughs> and just come over for one month every year and just drive through the American West. Wow. You know, so like it's, it's definitely a, it's, there's a lot of potential there. Yeah. There's a lot of potential. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't realize. Yeah. We're so fortunate. Mm -hmm. We're so fortunate to, you know, I, I, I'm a big Roosevelt fan that he set aside all this wilderness Yeah, and then, now of people who are like creating the routes so that other people can go out and experience all this beautiful land that we have here. A lot of people don't even really know about it or right. can't access it. And that's what your route does. And all, what all these other routes do, it's like, okay, you want to go see it? Here it yeah. is. Get on your bike. And here's information that'll help you, you know, yeah. go do it. <laughs> yeah. It's exciting. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for taking the time. I mean, I think, um, yeah, I don't think, I mean, the, the bikepacking community is going to benefit from just more cool places to go ride. All right. I'm going to ask you a hard one to close out with. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's not hard. I asked Lael the same question and I, uh, so I, I'm married to my wife and I have two daughters and, um, what, what advice could you give to them or just all women out there who are interested in getting into cycling and bikepacking and going on these kinds of adventures. Like what's the, what's your biggest advice you can give somebody? Start small and just go. Like, I don't care if it's just to ride your bike to the grocery store. Yeah. I, don't, I don't care if it's, you made it five miles down the road, you got on your bike and you went. And yeah. that's, that's the only way you're going to get started, yeah. you know? Um, and definitely, you know, find someone to ask questions. Yeah. Are you one of those people? Yeah. <laughs> Send me a message, you know, ask me questions. I, I just, I want to see more people outside yeah. on bikes. <laughs> well, you and I are on the same mission. I appreciate what you're doing. Um, I'm the same way, you know, you can always message me and I know for a fact, uh, watching you interact on the internet for years before I actually just met you, that you are a huge resource. And so I, I'll advocate for people to reach out to you. What's the best way to 
get in contact with you? Um, so you can instant message me, you know, on, on Facebook. Wonderlust on, by bike? Yeah, on, on Instagram, I'm Wonderlust. That's a W-U-N-D-E-R. Uh-huh. Uh, Wonderlust. And then you can you can email me at the same thing at Gmail. So it's so, uh, Wonderlust by bike at Gmail. At gmail.com. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you for coming on. This is awesome. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. I enjoyed it. All right. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, one more time before I get off of here and you switch over to your second favorite podcast, I just want to remind you that if you'd like to financially support the show, you can find me on Patreon at Bikes or Death. Um, you can also uh, support the show by leaving a review on iTunes, a five star review. That's the best one. Uh, don't forget. And, uh, and now I've made it even easier to support the show. Um, I set up an a- Amazon affiliate link. All you got to do is go to my website, bikesordeath.com, click that affiliate link, bookmark it, and then every time you buy something on Amazon, it takes a little bit of money out of Jeff Bezos' pocket, and it puts it into mine. And I think we can all agree that that is a better use of those dollars. I'm going to put it to such better use. I'm going to make it, I'm going to make great bikepacking podcast content from me to you. Simple. What is, is Jeff going to do that for you? I don't think so. No, he's going to he's gonna make like a, a skyscraper on the moon or something. He doesn't need a skyscraper on the moon, but we do need bikepacking content. And that's where you come in. All right, uh, what else? Hey, if you want to follow me, you can. You can follow me on Instagram at Bikes for Death. You can find me on Facebook, Bikes for Death. And if you just want to email me, you can do that too. Bikes at bikesordeath.com. Now, it's time to go ride your damn bike. And if you're already riding your bike... Give yourself a pat on the back. You earned it.